Good morning. If you would, open your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 1, specifically verses 12 through 20. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or death. The Jewish novelist, which his name, I, I'm sure I don't have the correct pronunciation, Chaim Potok, gave a lecture in John Hopkins University. And he told how he wanted to be a writer from an early age. But when he was ready to go off to college, his mom took him aside and said, I know you want to be a writer. But I have a better idea. Why don't you be a brain surgeon? You'll keep a lot of people from dying. You'll make a lot of money. He replied, no mama. I want to be a writer. And he returned home for vacation. And his mother got him off alone. I know you want to be a writer. But listen to your mama. Be a brain surgeon instead. You'll keep a lot of people from dying. You'll make a lot of money. And again, he replied, no, mama, I want to be a writer. And so this conversation was repeated at every vacation, every break, every summer, every meeting. The exchanges accumulated. The pressure intensified. Finally, there was the explosion. Son, you're wasting your time. Be a brain surgeon. You'll keep a lot of people from dying and you'll make a lot of money. And he replied, Mama, I don't want to keep people from dying. I want to show them how to live. And by the way, his novel, The Chosen, sold over three million copies. Philippians is Paul's writing to show people how to live. How to live with the mind of Christ. The Philippians are concerned about Paul. They want to know how Paul's living is going. They want to know, Paul, are you well? What's your living conditions in, in prison there? Are you, are you going to be released? They may have even thought that Paul's situation was surely a hindrance to the spread of the gospel. But in the rest of chapter 1, Paul assures the Philippians that though he is bound, the gospel is not. It is advancing. It is progressing. He is joyfully confident that no matter what happens, he will be, be delivered and Christ will be honored because to live for him is Christ. To die is gain. And Paul then encourages his readers to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. 
even amid suffering. And so he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me really has served to advance the gospel. Now, in ancient form of writing, this would be a sure indicator of a new section of the letter. This is the body of the letter. Paul is beginning the body of the letter, and they would understand that, and they would understand he's beginning on a personal note. They would think, okay, Paul's going to tell us how it's going with him. He's going to tell us what we really want to know about how Paul is doing. And so he begins on that personal note, sort of. See, Paul's eyes were not focused on himself. They were focused on Jesus and his gospel. And this shifts the whole focus. It shifts it away from Paul and what's happening to him and toward Christ and what is happening concerning the gospel. Now we all know the old adage, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Now, Paul would not have heard the, ad the adage, but he was quite uh, familiar with the philosophy. That's really an old philosophy. It goes back to Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and most uh, recently to Paul, uh, the Epicureans. Since becoming a Christian, we know the things that had happened to Paul. They knew things that had happened to Paul. Since becoming a Christian, Paul had been given a truckload of lemons. They knew of his beatings, stoning, shipwrecks, and all the perils that he describes in 2 Corinthians 11. His latest humiliation had been wrongful imprisonment. He'd spent two years at Caesarea. After appealing to Caesar, he'd been sent to Rome. And when Paul wrote Philippians, he's already been imprisoned at Rome for two years. And all of this, instead of listing it like he did in 2 Corinthians, instead of bringing that out, he sums that up in the simple phrase, my circumstances or what has happened to me. His mind was not focused on problems, but on progress. Paul's imprisonment did not mean that the gospel was held captive. On the contrary, Paul had a captive audience. They were hearing of the good news of Jesus Christ simply by being around Paul. Soldiers that he would have never had the opportunity to speak to. Soldiers that would have never had the opportunity to hear about Jesus were hearing the good news of Jesus of Nazareth. The gospel was advancing. Now the verb form of this word that's translated advance or progress means to cut forward. Originally, it was the word used for a pioneer cutting his way through uh, brushwood. The word was also used to describe the activity of army engineers as they went before the army cutting down obstacles, trees, and undergrowth that would impede the army's progress. He could also describe the ongoing march of that army over rugged terrain against opposition and obstacles. Kind of reminds me of General Patton. In June of 1944, before the Allied invasion of Europe, Patton spoke to his third army. And among other things, he told them, I don't want to get any messages saying I'm holding my position. We're not holding anything. We are advancing constantly and we're not interested in holding on to anything except the enemy. The gospel was making splendid progress. 
And Paul's imprisonment had actually contributed to that. Paul's imprisonment was clearing the way for the gospel in new places. The gospel was advancing constantly. Even though Paul's position was hindered, the gospel wasn't holding its position. It was advancing. Paul's telling the Philippians not to focus on him, but look at what's happening. This isn't bad. This is good. The thwarting have become thoroughfares. The difficulties have become doors. What seemed to be adverse has worked out to advance the gospel. And there's much more involved here than simple positive thinking. God is at work in all of this. Convinced of this, Paul can see that in his providence, God is working through circumstances in Paul's life to spread the gospel. While others might have been filled with self-pity, being imprisoned in such situations, we see no hint of bitterness from Paul here. When he viewed his situation, he didn't see tragedy. He saw triumph. He didn't think of himself as a victim, but as a victor. The challenge for us, as we read Philippians is to look through the apostle's eyes and see the situation as he saw it. And then we must apply that to our situation with the view to how can I advance the gospel in my current situation, whatever that situation is. God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes we say that and we kind of forget how, how true that is. God does work in mysterious ways. It's not mysterious to him, but it's mysterious to us. The gospel advances in ways that we would never have dreamed of. And Paul gives two examples of how the gospel is advancing. The first, he talks about the whole Praetorian Guard. The whole palace guard is aware that Paul is there because of his faith in Christ and not because he has violated the decrees of Caesar. If Paul had gone to Rome as he originally planned and preached the gospel there in the Roman Forum, probably not a one of these soldiers would have stopped to listen. However, since they were chained to him day and night, He would have been a little bit hard to ignore. God truly works in mysterious ways. If Paul was under the normal circumstances of one in chains under house arrest, during the day, there would have been no less than four soldiers in his presence, most likely actually chained to him. It's kind of hard not to hear just a little bit of the gospel as Paul, as we know his character, would sing and pray and have conversations with those that were allowed to come in uh, into him, such as Timothy and evidently Epaphroditus. And as he dictated letters to the churches, they would, by default, hear some things about Christ that they would have never heard. The everyone else or the all the rest. That probably refers to the wider circle around the Praetorian Guard. But it would also include others that Paul had influenced. You know, in the first century Roman world, in the city of Rome, word traveled just as fast as it does in 21st century Nikiski or anywhere else. When I was growing up in Bradford, Arkansas, word traveled so fast that people knew what I did before I even did it. (laughs) 
People are having conversations about this Jew named Paul who is a Roman citizen and is bound because of this guy named Jesus that people call Christ. In their circles of friends and those circles of friends, people are talking about things concerning Jesus. The second example Paul gives of the advancing of the gospel is that most of the brethren, not all of them, but most of them have been emboldened to speak the word without fear. Now when the Christians in Rome, where Paul was imprisoned, saw his boldness even as his life was in jeopardy, they were inspired to be more courageous as well. They may have reasoned that if God can do great things through a man in chains, he can do great things through us in our freedom of movement. Paul's plight likely caused them to increase their efforts to spread the gospel so that the gospel wouldn't suffer while one of its greatest preachers was restricted in his movement. They might have said, look what Paul has done and look what Paul is doing to advance the gospel. They would have asked themselves the question we ought to ask ourselves. What can I do to spread the gospel? What am I doing to spread the gospel? Can I do more to spread the gospel? The word translated speak here is not the word for preach or pro proclaim. It's the ordinary term meaning to speak. And commentators have suggested that the emphasis was not on public proclamation, but it was on the day-to-day -day speech and sharing of the gospel by every Christian. Celsus, an early Christian critic, wrote, The leather dressers, wool workers, cobblers, the most illiterate and vulgar of mankind are zealous preachers of the gospel. Now Celsus meant that as a criticism, but it was high praise. It was high praise because the counter of the merchant, the desk of the tax collector, the plow handles of the farmers, that was their pulpits. Paul's imprisonment gave Christians such as these greater courage to simply have conversations about Jesus. And Paul then addresses a situation of doing right from wrong motives. Exactly who those are that preach Christ from envy and rivalry, rivalry is not stated. They are preaching Christ. They were not unbelievers or even Jews that persecuted Paul in the past. Even though sometimes he calls them brothers. Their brothers in the flesh, the Jews. They would not be brothers. Some suggest it's the Judaizers, the Jewish Christians who taught that you must keep the law of Moses as well in order to be saved. But... Paul would not have rejoiced in their message. They constantly afflicted Paul in the early church. He would not rejoice in their message. On the contrary, he's condemned their message. He's condemned them as false teachers. Paul is rejoicing in the message of those that are mentioned in Philippians 1.18. There's no condemnation here. Now there are those that we know by their actions that are arrogant and hypocritical. But they preach Christ truthfully. The problem was not 
with the message. It was with the motive of the messenger. Now there's a sobering lesson here that uh, we really need to come to terms with and understand. It is possible to do right things out of wrong motives. As scary as that may be. Paul does not rejoice in the wrong motive of those who preach out of envy and strife. He rejoices in the message. And that message is Christ. The great benevolent heart of the apostle rejoices that Christ is being preached. And that message will save regardless of the messenger. Paul rejoices that Christ is being preached regardless of motive. But we need to have some caution here. We need to not think that Paul is saying that motive doesn't matter. Motive is crucially important to the one who has the motive. Let us always spread the gospel out of goodwill and love with the right motives. Paul ends this section of advancing the gospel with a competent knowledge that through the prayers of the Philippians and the help of the Holy Spirit that he will be delivered. What does that tell you about prayers from your brothers and sisters in Christ? Boy, it's powerful. It's right, right up there with some of the most powerful help we have. Through their prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul has a confident understanding that he will be delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from, from prison? Perhaps, but according to a few statements in chapter 2, he may not have been all that confident about his release. Delivered from slander and mistreatment. That's possible. Paul doesn't indicate that he's quoting Job, but the, uh, the verbiage and terminology here is almost exact to that, what is found in Job 13, 13 through 18. What Paul is saying is that he's meaning the same thing that Job meant in verse 18. That he would be vindicated. Job didn't do anything wrong. Job had not broken the laws of God. And he was confident that he would be vindicated. Confident among his friends who said, Job, you messed up. You done something. You better do some repenting and some soul searching. I haven't done anything wrong. And he was confident that he would be vindicated. And so is Paul. Maybe it's delivered from embarrassment before the courts. That's, that's possible and may even be probable, especially given what he says about full courage and boldness in the next verse. He may be thinking of eternal salvation, mentioning being delivered. That's possible as well. And most likely, what Paul is thinking about when he thinks he's confident that he will be delivered is a combination of all of these. You know, sometimes we kind of get stuck, well, it either means this or it means that. A lot of times it's not an either or situation. It's a both and situation. Paul prays that he will have boldness to do what he has always done and defend Christ. He wants the Philippians to know that whatever happens, whether my release from prison materializes or not, whatever happens to me, I am determined to exalt Christ in whatever I do. And he wishes this for the Philippians as well. What faith that is. 
standing strong in the faith that he has in Christ, sure that he'll be delivered through prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, but even if not, he's determined to glorify Christ. I want to share a poem with you. Blow the trump and ring the bell. Dress it up and make it sell. Fill it with the rich and well. And count their heads. We're doing well. But where's the faith? Read the creed and get it right. Hold it fast with all your might. Close the door and bolt it tight. We've no need for further light. But where's the faith? Build the church and make it grow. Cushioned pews in classic row. Made for comfort we love so. Come in, relax, enjoy the show. But where's the faith? Like James said, that's a whole lot of religious activity. But it's not the saving relationship of faith with our Lord Jesus Christ. But. In the sick room on the bed, invalid, helpless, but not dead, hear her praying through the pain. May my suffering be your gain. There is the faith. No matter what happens to me in my life, may I always glorify thee. Where is our faith? Is it, manis- is it manifested in our lives or is it hidden? If we were arrested for being a Christian, like Paul was, when it came to our trial, would there be enough evidence to convict us? Let us go through life faithfully collecting evidence so that in our life or even in our death, Christ may be glorified in our bodies. Whatever the situation may be, help us to look outwardly toward Christ and the advance of his gospel, whatever our situation is. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord in any way, if you have need whatsoever, we'll pray with you and we'll pray for you. If you'll come, together we stand and sing.